style, eh? Yeah. It's very important. Is and by the way, they're the best at agribusiness. <laughs> they can make the desert a paradise. Some of them are not saying that they are not believing, right? So it's good to see them. That's what you are. Ah, ah. My commander at that time was Amnon, sitting here to the left with his shorts. And my team members were these three guys who are sitting here, Ilan, Eyal and Alex. Uh, we were in the last week of military service. We were called back from home. And within 24 hours we had to prepare this uh, operation. Uh, it was a very difficult operation from our perspective. Um, We had very short time to prepare for it, and uh, it was a huge distance. It was 4,000 kilometers from Israel, and we didn't know almost anything about Uganda. I mean, we knew that uh, it is on the equator, but we didn't know anything about the local uh, earth, the roads, the terrain. We didn't know anything, and this is a critical parameter in preparing such a mission. Uh, that said, uh, our intelligence community was able to gather a lot of information within the 48 hours that were left to prepare the mission. We took off from uh, Israel at the uh, afternoon of uh, July 3rd. At the time we didn't even notice that this is exactly the 200th anniversary of the United States. Uh, the flight was very long, it was about seven and a half hours. And uh, we landed here, we were in the first plane that landed, in total landed four planes. We landed here uh, almost at midnight. The airfield was uh, totally quiet. They the, the air control didn't notice at the beginning that uh, this is a hostile or uh, a non-invited plane, let's say. Uh, the plane taxied till the end of the airstrip. We disembarked from the plane. And within less than two minutes, we were able to reach to the terminal and to remove the immediate danger on the hostage's life by killing four terrorists that uh, were uh, keeping an open eye on them in the hall of the terminal. Uh, later on, there was a battle which uh, lasted, let's say, about one hour to evacuate all the hostages uh, from the terminal itself to the uh, plants and then we took off. We landed in Nairobi and we came back. Uh, during this operation uh, we lost our commander. He was uh, a colonel. Uh, Yoni Netanyahu is a bra bra the ex-brother of the current uh, Prime Minister of Israel. Um, that's it, we found, we met a very brave Ugandan uh, soldiers in the control tower. They didn't stop uh, shooting and in their perspective protecting their country. For the whole time of the operation, we were very impressed from it. Uh, we were able to open some uh, cover fire and to evacuate everyone. And then we took off, we landed in Nairobi, we refueled. We didn't know, by the way, that we are going to refuel in Nairobi, but it happened, and then we took off back to Israel. I think that this is the essence of this operation. It was well executed, and uh, a big success from our perspective. That's it, I think. If you have any more questions, I'll be happy to answer. And again, I'm, I'm very embarrassed from this situation, I must admit. Our instructions in Israel before we came over here that the Ugandan people or soldiers are not our enemies. We came to rescue our brothers, our people, and intend to hurt only the terrorists, and we have no intention, not whatsoever, to shoot any Ugandan soldiers that were not uh, in actually involved in uh, fighting against us. Whoever kept himself aside, we left, uh, left him alone, and we didn't touch him, and we have all the respect to the Ugandan people, and we never had in any intention to, to hurt you. That's what I wanted to say. According to my father, he had gone to Mauritius to hand over the baton. There's a baton for, for the chairmanship to the Mauritian president. Then he got a message from his ambassador in Lesotho, who told him, 
the Israelites are going to attack. Apparently, he boarded quickly and took off. 30 minutes before they attacked, he had landed. And in fact, the fourth C-130 was supposed to have a mission to go and apprehend him at the VIP launch. The one with the sergeant who, who fell, he was shot by Captain Raphael. There was an escort. In the VIP launch, when the commandos were coming up the steps, Raphael shot huh? the other sergeant. What's his name again? Su 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 so he fell over, and the other commandos rushed after Raphael, who rushed, cleverly rushed into the toilet. You know, in a toilet situation, commandos know that you don't know where the bullets will come. So they left the mission, uh, they aborted the mission to try and get my father. But my father had already gone to state house. So from that day onwards, Musei would say that they had actually killed three. That was the, the count then. But I was surprised to find out that Sarge, that sergeant is still alive. And he's one of those people who would want to meet. But the important thing was, my father felt, had actually, by the way, the year before he had passed a resolution against Israel, which actually made Israel very angry. The UN resolution that equated Zionism, not Hebrew, not Israel, but Zionism, an ideology, to apartheid. He passed that resolution and, and it passed with only abstentions and uh, rejection by Israel and, and America. But the whole of Africa, the whole of uh, South America, and the whole of Europe supported the resolution. That got Israel very angry. And they realized Amin was not just a boaster. He was doing something at the highest level of governance, which is the UN. So by 76, it was almost like, teach this man a lesson he will never forget. So when he accepted, actually, the, the hostages were supposed to go to Libya, but Gaddafi cleverly, cleverly said, no, take them to Amin. For him, he was just a willing participant. In fact, the same resolution in 75 was engineered by the whole of the Arab world. The financing of us getting the OAU, the building, you know that super building that happened here? Huh? All that financing. The Arabs were basically saying, we need a platform. And my father had basically become a spokesperson for the Arab cause and the, the Palestinian cause in particular. So I tend to believe he put him, himself and the country in harm's way in that way, instead of focusing on what he was good at. By the way, he was good at home affairs, despite the fact that there were people fighting him and there's a history of accusations that, that a lot of people died. But he was actually, he had a better rapport at home than on international affairs. So my whole point was, one day I asked him, this was a personal question. I said, it only takes 15 minutes for MiG-21s to come from Gulu. You, you could have, you could have, uh, you could have uh, intercepted the, the, the Hercules while they were still on the water back to Nairobi. He said a very strange thing. He said, those are the children of God. Once they start to fight, they never stop. <laughs> when an Israeli starts to fight, he never stops. You know? So for him, he realized they have got what they want. I cannot increase the pressure by starting to bomb the planes. It takes only 15 minutes, by the way, MiG-21, to reach Entebbe from where? From Gulu. Okay? I have spent a lot of years researching and also talking with my father about issues involving his, his rule in Uganda. And this one bears a special meaning to what he was all about. Personally, as Jafar, I go around Uganda on reconciliation missions where I meet communities and we do what we call community reconciliation. Today I've been surprised by meeting former foes and we've managed to even uh, greet each other. I was only 10 years old in 1976, but at the, by October, I'll be 50 years old. 
And 50 years is an important stage in anybody's life where you seek your enemies and you, you learn to say sorry to each other. It is called reconciliation. By meeting you, it is very symbolic of a new change. I am at the forefront of reconciliation, even though some people still have pain. By the way, the, the, the family of the gentleman who shot Yoni from the clock tower lives in Arua. One day, you might have to travel there and meet the man who shot Kano Yoni Netanyahu. It would be a very important meeting. I know the family. They're cousins of ours. And we also have to remember that 20 Ugandans died that day. And there's pain on both sides. There's a list of families from Israel that I would want to actually meet in future. Let me read the families. The first one is Yoni Netanyahu. These are victims from Israel. There's Jean Jacques, they're actually French, Israelis. There's actually Pasco Cohen. There's a family, Pasco Cohen. There was Ida Borovich. He was actually a Holocaust vict uh, survivor. He died that day also. Yeah. But I believe it was friendly fire. I believe it was friendly fire. Huh? Yeah. So Jacques, Jacques, Jean Jacques and uh, Ida actually from, from friendly fire. Because with Ida, the wife was on the other side of the hall and she was calling for help. So for him he stood up. Yet you had commanded no one should stand up. Then the most painful one was Dora Block. So for me, at a personal level, these are the type of people, families I would want to meet. And we, we sort of do reconciliation like, like we're doing. I'm just saying that history happens in its own way. But also we have to live. And also remember, also we had 20 people who died that day who are Ugandans. He called them friends. I'm just mentioning there were 20 soldiers. The ones who were defending the country, but you had a mission to save your own people also. I'd be so happy to even be accepted to go to Israel and meet these families. I've listed the five families. They always talk of one person. In every segment of Uganda, even today, Museveni has people who might feel aggrieved. So anyone who has any grievances against Amin are the people I meet. But we do it with the religious people. It's not political. It even actually started in Namboli. Museveni started it. He said sorry on behalf of the former eight leaders. What they call the Jubilee Network. Then you move around the country and you meet people. By the way, in some areas, you can come up in front of 50,000 people and then 40 families come up and say this they accuse your father directly even though he wasn't the one but they'll say your father killed my parents at such a moment what do you do for me personally i've taken it upon myself to own up to my name you have to take ownership of your name by the way and once you take ownership of your name then you're able to stand and say please forgive my father for me it is a it's a personal how would I call it? Cause. But I wish people would understand that we need to be able to say sorry to each other. And that's why I'm telling these four commandos that eventually, I pray, there are five, there are five commanders, that I'll be able, I pray that I'm able to go there and meet the five families because they were five victims of that rescue. Families, I mean. Just the way I do in Uganda. And I'm not saying my father committed all that, but accusations are there. It is important for, for people to take ownership of their name. Once you take ownership of your name, then you have the courtesy to show remorse and be able to say sorry. For me, that's, that's, that's what I do. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
לא לקחת מתנות בינינו. Thank you. Thank you.